Um, I want to extend my thanks also to the um, Arts of Asia program, uh, the Society for Asian Art, um, and in particular to Dr. Um, Patricia Berger at Berkeley and Dr. Jeff Durham at the Asian Art Museum. I also want to thank uh, Jennifer Cowell and, and Crystal Lee, co-chairs of the Arts of Asia Lecture Series, for all of their um, efforts on the logistical front to make this possible. I'm honored and delighted to be here. Um, it's the uh, Art, Asian Art Museum is one that I've, I've always cherished and vis made, made a point of visiting every time I've been in San Francisco. And I guess I'm especially honored to be here in that, as you've heard, I'm not an art historian, far from it. My training is in comparative literature. I'm currently chairing a large English department, which is to say that I'm much more of a words person than an image person. Um, and the implications of this I think you'll see is that there's probably a noticeable lack of visual flair in the design of my PowerPoint slides. I've never gotten very good at that. And, and you'll also find that my presentation, while it does have a lot of pictures, is concerned less with the close study of individual objects and more with um, thinking through various ways we might um, look at those objects in a kind of historical and comparative perspective. My aim in this talk is to explore two related, interrelated problems. The first problem I'm interested in concerns the contours of the exotic as a concept and as an aesthetic experience. What precisely do we mean when we call something exotic? What kinds of experience do we include or exclude in that category? What are the components of that experience? Uh, the exotic, and how does the exotic as an experience com compare with other kinds of aesthetic response? So that's problem one I want to talk about. Problem two is uh, concerns the pros and cons of different kinds of inter intercultural comparison as um, methods of research in historical study. When I will ask, is comparison justified as a method? When is it helpful in seeing things that we might not otherwise see? What are the limiting factors we should consider in using comparison as a method uh, instead of other kinds of methods? Both of these topics, the exotic and comparison, are very often studied, but they're very rarely considered together, which is what I want to do today. My justification for thinking about these two problems together uh, is twofold. In a purely abstract sense, I think you'll agree with me if I suggest that the category of the exotic always implies comparison. Right? Something could be exotic only in relation to something else, after all. And secondly, in historical terms, uh, transcultural comparisons have often relied on categories of the exotic. Uh, so in those two senses, in a kind of philosophical sense and a, in a, in a historical sense, I think these to two topics are more closely related than might immediately appear to be the case. So the historical context in which I'll be exploring these two problems uh, can be broadly summarized as uh, the long 18th century, or I'll be using the term early modern, uh, the early modern context of China and Europe, um, 17th and 18th centuries mostly. Uh, the broad contours of the civilizational encounter between China and the West in this period is, is widely known. The point I'll emphasize throughout this talk, and which really is the foundation for the talk, is that this encounter between China and Europe in the early modern period is really a two-way encounter that is of lasting significance. That is, the um, dialogical or Reciprocal nature of the encounter is important in all sorts of lastingly significant ways. As I'm sure many of you know, uh, the European Jesuits and later uh, merchants and diplomats uh, began going to China uh, beginning in the 16th century, and the story begins there. They brought with them people like uh, um, Adam von, von Schall, depicted here. They brought with them two China artifacts concepts and techniques relating to theology, of course, but also astronomy, painting, clockwork, and cartography. Very soon thereafter, though, and this is perhaps equally known, but not really known thought together, artifacts began flowing uh, in the opposite direction. Artifacts, concepts, techniques 
began flowing through the China trade from China, of course, back to Europe. Uh, this reverse flow included objects, craft works, and so on, but also um, philosophical ideas, ideas about statecraft, ideas about lexicography and language, about ethics, and of course the visual arts. It's by now widely accepted that this early modern encounter proved historically transformative on both sides, as much in Europe as it was in China. Um, this is especially true with respect to the arts, in, most obviously, but also well beyond the arts as well. Uh, with respect to statecraft, one can argue that, that European statecraft was influenced by Chinese ideas, Chinese statecraft was influenced by European ideas, so there are all sorts of reciprocal effects. And it's also clear, I think, that the ripple effects going forward of this early modern encounter resonate well into the current century. So it really is a moment of encounter that has long historical effects. My talk today will have four main parts. Uh, the first is, what is exoticism? Second, exoticism in the early modern world. Third, unexpected affinities and the limits of contiguity. I'll explain what I mean by that. And then fourth, comparative exoticisms. So. Okay, part one. What is exoticism? What do we mean by this term? How is it used? What are its context and limitations? Exoticism seems, at first glance, a category that we know or that we should know, we should be able to define almost intuitively. On further reflection, though, as we probe a little bit deeper, we find that as a visual attribute for objects, and especially for early modern objects, it's a category that's far easier to recognize and enjoy, perhaps in an intuitive, unthinking way, than it is to actually define and pin down. So to get us started in this work of pinning down what we mean exactly by exoticism, perhaps it's useful to compare exoticism as a category with other kinds of descriptive terms for visual styles that might have been available uh, or might have been familiar, rather, to the 18th century European traveler. We're talking about the, the 18th century here for the most part, so let's, let's look at some, some, some categories of, of visual objects that we use in describing those kinds of um, images or objects. And notice as we go through this list of these images how readily we can identify and pinpoint defining characteristics of each of these terms. So, for example, when we talk about the Baroque, we can identify it fairly easily with ornateness and extravagance, a fairly readily familiar and predictable kinds. If we talk about the neoclassical, we immediately bring to mind certain images of symmetry and austerity as stylistic descriptors. When we talk about the romantic, we can conjure up fairly readily and consistently ideas of sublimity and emotional expressiveness, whether in the visual arts or in music or in literature. All of these terms, of course, have a kind of periodizing uh, effect. We use terms like Baroque, Neoclassical, and Romantic to refer to periods as well as styles. Uh, but even non-periodizing descriptions of objects and scenes often have fairly clear um, attributes. So for example, the picturesque is often associated with the visually charming or quaint in a scene, the sublime, in any period is associated with feelings of power and excess. And the pastoral is associated with ide idealized visions of agricultural life, regardless of the period. All of these terms and categories, I think you'll agree, admit of descriptive textbook-like definitions. There's a reliable, consistent correspondence, that is, between the term and the image that we can all more or less agree on. If I say a word like sublime in a room full of art historians or docents, we're all likely to conjure up similar kinds of images in our imagination. If I show you a painting, of, uh, a painting by Turner of a ship in a storm, we're all likely to come up with similar aesthetic categories to describe both that painting and the experience that it evokes for us. I find the term exotic, in contrast, an interesting term 
within an art historical context because while it is used like picturesque or romantic as a descriptive adjective to characterize images, you can talk about an exotic landscape, an exotic scene, an exotic building, exotic costume or something. On closer examination, it turns out not to be a reliable descriptive category at all, but rather a purely re relational category that depends entirely on its context for its effects. So in other words, if you do, you do a little thought experiment, if I say the word neoclassical, you, know, you can immediately bring to mind certain kinds of images that are going to be very similar for, for all of us or for anybody who studied any, any art history. If you say a word like exotic, the range of images that are going to come to our mind are very diffuse, different. They're very hard to pin down in such a narrow way as we can the, narrow class, the neoclassical. Uh, in this respect, exotic as a term is less like the adjectives baroque, romantic, or pastoral, and more like the adjectives strange, unfamiliar, or unique, in that all of these kinds of terms require some kind of relational qualification, right? So if, to call something strange or unique implies the question strange or unique in relation to what, right? Uh, unique within what context? Exotic for whom? Right? Exotic is not an absolute category like the neoclassical. It's a relational, relative category. So here's an example of what I mean. Um, in this still life painting, the Chinese porcelains, prominently depicted, introduce an element of the exotic. That's clear. That's what they're there for. That's what they intend to do. We see very similar, um, a very similar vase in this contemporary Chinese painting, right, in the context of which the vase doesn't seem at all exotic. Right? The vase is simply not exotic in the context of the second painting, reminding us that the, seemingly, the seeming exoticism of the first vase does not actually inhere in the vase, but rather in its relationship to its context. So as, I, as my focus today is specifically on relationality and comparison in this sense, I want to pursue a bit further um, what kind of relation precisely is implied by the exotic. So here we'll get down into the weeds a little bit in, in terms of trying to come to terms with this very often used but very rarely investigated category. Uh, and I'm going to propose that the, the concept of the exotic as we typically use it involves three distinct components. The four, a, 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 um, a geographical component, a temporal component, and an aesthetic component. And I'll talk about each of those in turn. I propose that the first obvious component of the exotic as a category is a geographical one, right? Perhaps most obviously, um, the exotic implies foreign. Exotic, by definition, is that which is not familiar, not domesticated. It seems strange. It's always from another place. This much seems indisputable. But can the exotic be from any foreign or distant place, or only a certain kind of distant or foreign place? Will any variety of foreignness do the trick, that is, to conjure up the experience of the exotic for us. Let's consider as a thought experiment the perspective of an, an imaginary 18th century English traveler. For such a traveler, uh, a chinoiserie house that they encountered in an English garden or a German garden um, would probably seem exotic. It's built to be exotic. It's meant to evoke exoticism. Um, uh, but a Sicilian villa that the same traveler might encounter in the course of a grand tour in southern Italy would arguably appear less exotic, even though in some sense it's equally foreign. Right? You don't have a lot of Sicilian villas in Essex, right? Uh, but somehow it seems less exotic than the Chinese house. The implication is that the exotic implies not just foreignness, in other words, but foreignness to a high, 
or exaggerated degree. The second component of the exotic to the 18th century viewer, I think we could probably agree, is an aesthetic one. The exotic, after all, evokes a particular kind of aesthetic response, right? Not all forms of foreignness um, evoke that kind of aesthetic, that, that, that sense of the exotic. There's something aesthetic. There's an aesthetic dimension in our experience of the exotic. Um, and artifacts marked by extreme foreignness evoke this aesthetic response to widely differing degrees. So let's go back to our imaginary 18th century English observer and speculate that, yes, probably if this 18th century English observer encountered this imported uh, Turkish dress, right? We have Turkish dresses worn by um, characters in 18th century English novels like uh, Roxana, so we can imagine that they were sometimes on display. I imagine the 18th century English observer would consider this an exotic costume, right? Uh, similarly, we know that the same observer would have considered this imported Ming Dynasty plate exotic um, for similar kinds of reasons. In the case of both the dress and the plate, there's something, there's a distinct aesthetic element to our response that goes beyond the exaggerated foreignness of these two experiences. Contrast the experience of the dress and the plate, if you would, to two other equally foreign objects that the same traveler might encounter, and notice the difference in the nature of the experience conjured by these things. This is a picture of a, of a roundhouse in Fujian um, province, uh, which was very typical in the 18th century. I'm going to claim that this, that had our English traveler seen this roundhouse, although they would have recognized it as exaggeratedly foreign, it does not have that aesthetic dimension uh, that fills out the experience of the exotic in the other two cases. Likewise, had our observer encountered this Ottoman battle axe from roughly the same period, I'm guessing they wouldn't have had an exotic kind of experience with respect to that either. I think they might have actually been kind of grossed out by the, the blood stains visible just behind the blade and wondering wonder whose head had been chopped off with it, which is not the kind of imaginative fantasy that pairs very well with our standard notion of an exotic experience, right? So the exotic seems to require, in addition to exaggerated foreignness, uh, an obvious appeal to an aesthetic sensibility, which might be linked, we could speculate, with a prominently ornamental or decorative function. And I suspect that's part of why the battle axe and the Fujian roundhouse don't really seem to qualify, right? They don't have um, an obviously aesthetic, decorative, ornamental function the way that these two objects do. So, uh, moving then on from exaggerated foreignness and the aesthetic component, I would suggest that the third component of the exotic, as we commonly understand it, is a temporal component. Here, what I mean to remind us of is that the pleasure of ornamental foreignness, we think of as exotic, is linked also to an experience of novelty and surprise. That is to say, although the aesthetic experience of the exotic is aesthetic, it's an aesthetic with a limited expiration date, right? Something can only be novel, and it can only be exotic, therefore, for a limited amount of time, and then it becomes Blase, right? So we've all had this experience, I'm sure, in the course of our lives of um, experiencing hummus and sushi, perhaps for the first time. Remember the first time you ate those foods? They haven't been around for all of our lifetimes. The first time we encountered these foods, surely they struck us as exotic. Now you go to any old supermarket, and Trader Joe's, right? And, and, and you can pick up these things on your way home from work. They've become unexotic. It's the same food but it's become unexotic because it's no longer novel. This happened um, very obviously with imported commodities like tea, for example, and Chinese porcelain over the course of the 18th century. Chinese porcelain and tea were very definitely exotic when they were first encountered by 
English people in the late 17th century, and they're very clearly not exotic when they were referred to in totally matter-of-fact ways in Jane Austen's novels at the end of the 18th century. So, unlike the Baroque as an aesthetic category, which will always be Baroque and will always carry with it the particular aesthetic charge of the Baroque, or the pastoral, which will always be the pastoral and carry with it that prescribed aesthetic charge, the quality of the exotic is a transient and therefore temporally bounded and contingent one. We can talk about an exotic fashion. We can talk about an enduring fashion. But we cannot sensibly talk about an enduringly exotic fashion, can we? We immediately recognize the oxymoron in such a formulation, which I think um, confirms the intuition that the exotic is closely linked with this temporal dimension as well as the geographical and the aesthetic dimensions. I'd like to point out that the common thread in all three of these components of the exotic, the intensely foreign, the ornamental, and the transient, is a degree of relationality, right? A relativism of relationality in contrast to the other aesthetic categories we talked about early, earlier. Now, you might reasonably ask, why does this matter? Why spend so much time trying to dissect and analyze this category of the, the exotic? One reason I think that these categories are interesting and that this, this, this relativizing relational dimension of these aspects of the exotic is interesting is that it's precisely these relativizing attributes of the exotic that make it such a powerful and attractive and fertile ground for utopianism. If you think about it, the category of the exotic evokes comparison with the here and now. It evokes comparison with our ordinary, banal, everyday lives, for which, for, um, which is always, in some sense, a tiresome and overly familiar and dull and boring one, which is why we seek out experience of the exotic and, and, and of, 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 of the utopian. The place of the exotic, in contrast, in its utter foreignness, transience, and impracticality tends to be the site of our most powerful and enduring utopian yearnings. And in fact, we might go so far as to say that the exotic, precisely because of these relative qualities, makes utopian imaginings possible in the first instance. Certainly in the 18th century, these utopian yearnings latched themselves very consistently to particular sites of exoticism. One familiar example is the idea of the noble savage, a very common one in the 18th century, as you know. Um, the land of the noble savage as conjured by Rousseau, by Captain Cook, by the traveler Bougainville, the artist Charvet, whose painting is depicted here, um, tended to have in common images of certain kinds of exotic people, Tahitians, for example, living in a state of pre-lapsarian grace, right? Garden of Eden before the fall, a, a, a state of natural morality to which sin and the corruptions of civilization were foreign, and a, a place of a social order without hierarchy, vanity, or shame, which were increasingly identified in the 18th century as the hallmarks of perhaps excessively developed civilization. Another site of utopian imaginings in the 18th century, of course, was China. Uh, in this fantasy, China was imagined as a place that boasted a moral order that was sustained without an all-powerful church, it was imagined as a place where philosophers were kings, where language was preserved by a philosophically grounded script, Chinese characters, against the depredations and degradations of the vernacular, and as a place where religious zealotry, persecution, and warfare were all but unknown. So China had a utopian um, a cast to it in the same way that the South Pacific did. 
And um, in both of these cases, both the Noble Savage and, and, and the Chinese case, uh, I think we can see the correlation between the utopian fantasies attached to these places and the exotic qualities that were associated with the objects from these places. And I want to suggest that this, this correspondence is by no means coincidental. OK, so let's move on to part two now. Part two, as you'll remember, is exoticism in the early modern world. We've talked about what exoticism is, what the experience of it is like, what did exoticism actually look like in the early modern world to people like our imaginary 18th century voyager. What were the dominant circuits of exoticism in the 18th century? From the European perspective, I think there were probably four major geographical sites of exoticism as we've defined it. The first was the Americas, broadly defined. The second was the Pacific Islands. And I'm not going to talk about um, those at all. We want to get on to China. The third category was the Ottoman Empire, the, the third location of exoticism, where the, uh, associated with coffee, costumes, and carpets, the three Cs. Um, which, were, which all had a powerful exotic allure on Western Europeans in the early 18th century, right? So the Americas, the Pacific Islands, and the Ottoman Empire, all prominent sites of exoticism. And then, of course, the fourth was China. Now, the story of Chinese exoticism in Europe, as you know, begins with imported Chinese goods, which began coming back into Europe in the 17th century, specifically with um, exotic porcelains of the late Ming and early Qing dynasties, many of which you have in the museum here. These imported goods, these por porcelains and other wares, were followed uh, rapidly uh, in the, 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 the quickly expanding China trade by exotic furniture, wallpapers, and decorative wares of many different kinds. These imported goods soon sparked efforts at imitation as you know, by European artisans giving rise to the style known as chinoiserie. We see chinoiserie, of course, in ceramics most prominently, but also in home furnishings, um, beds, uh, fire screens, and the like, and fanciful visual designs of many different kinds. All of these chinoiserie designs, as well as the Chinese imports themselves, foregrounded or exaggerated seemingly exotic elements of the so-called Chinese style, which, if you look at contemporary accounts of the way the style was received, were associated with precisely the categories of the exotic that we've outlined above. They were described as extravagantly foreign, purely decorative, right? objects that foregrounded an ornamental function and foregrounded their lack of usefulness, their lack of, 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 of um, practical uh, uses, and their transience. That is to say, it was well recognized in 18th century England that the Chinese taste, the fad for things Chinese, was a passing fancy. It wasn't going to last very long. And it was criticized um, for the same. Now, uh, so we, so we, we have China as a major site of exoticism for 18th century England, but the question I posed was about circuits of exoticism. It's, it's very common in considering the, the phenomenon of exoticism in the early modern period to assume something of a hub, a hub and spokes model. We tend to assume that Europe is at the center and the rest of the world is at the outside, that the outside peripheral um, places produce objects that then the Europeans experience as exotic, and that's the main uh, dynamic of exoticism in the period. But I think this is a mistaken model, which, which would, it would serve us well to, 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 to get out of. Every instance of sustained, peaceable encounter between um, cultures, after all, is likely going to involve some degree of exoticism or exotic experience in both directions. And certainly, there's no shortage of instances in early modern world history where European objects were in fact deemed exotic by peoples in other places. Now the standout instance of this kind of reciprocal 
exoticism, Europeans being deemed as exotic to outsiders as outsiders were deemed exotic to Europeans, is, of course, China, or maybe not, of course. That's the, <laughs> that's the argument I want to make. You'll say, of course, by the end of the hour, I assure you. Um, there's no other case where we find, in, in er the early modern period, where we find such a sustained personal encounter between the elites, the elite classes of two highly literate, non-contiguous, distant cultural spheres, as we have between China and Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. So in other words, the, hu the hub and spokes model that is familiar to us really cannot be sustained on closer examination. At the same time, after all, as European elites were building imitation Chinese temples in their gardens near London, the Chinese emperor, Qianlong, was building European mansions in his gardens near Beijing. And these are almost exactly contemporaneous. At roughly the same time that Queen, Char the, uh, the Queen Anne and other English elites were assembling massive collections of porcelains at their palaces near London, Chinese porcelains, of course, the Chinese emperor was amassing collections of European clocks at the Forbidden City in Beijing, also roughly contemporaneous phenomena. And at the same time, as wealthy European connoisseurs were delighting in the peculiar and exotic flattening effects of Chinese styles of visual representation, where you get a picture plane that seems to bring together foreground, background, and middle ground into a single plane. People found that fascinating and exotic. Um, the Chinese emperor was taking perhaps equal delight mm -hmm. in the peculiar and equally exotic volumizing effects of European techniques of perspective and illusionistic painting. So um, I, I mean to draw a contrast between the Europeans' delight in this Chinese-styled um, uh, figure, for example, um, and these Chinese depictions of European figures, which are delighting in the kind of um, three-dimensional illusions conjured up by the folds and the garments and the very careful attention to shadowing, which is not a, a traditional technique in Chinese visual representation. These are exotic images in part because the, the um, of the, the fancy hairdos and hats and so on, but also because they are represented as exaggeratedly three-dimensional figures, which I'm arguing has the same kind of exotic um, effect on the Chinese as, as the flattened Chinese figures do on the Europeans. This, this contrast holds in architectural renderings as well. So this is a, a typical um, imported uh, fire screen from the Qing Dynasty uh, coming into Europe. Europeans enjoyed the exotic effects, again, of the flattening of the picture plane um, at the same time as the Chinese emperor was learning from and enjoying the illusionistic painting techniques of European painters in Beijing that, that master painters in the Chinese palace were learning from um, to create these, extra these, these wonderful um, illusionistic scenes where uh, you can't really tell from a picture what's, what's real and what's not, and that's the entire purpose. It's about creating illusionistic three-dimensional spaces, which, if you think of it, have exactly the opposite effect of the flattening of the picture plane in the Chinese screen. And I, my, my suggestion is that what was fun, what was delightful, what was exotic for the viewers in, two, in both places was the kind of reversal of traditional expectations of the ways things would be represented, the way space would be represented in particular. Notice the exotic um, European clock in the center of the image there too. Here's a, here's a detail. Um, so all of these are painted, but they're painted in such a way as to conjure up an illusion of a three-dimensional reality, which was so effective that visitors were known to step into the room and just be completely taken aback and touch the image to see if it was an image or a real space. So that brings us then to um, the third part, which I'll go through um, most of before we take uh, a break. The, the third part of the lecture is called uh, Unexpected 
affinities. And here I want to reckon with the question of what we are to make of the fact of this reciprocal exoticism. It is rather surprising, right? I think most of us are probably familiar with chinoiserie. We're familiar with the European fascination with Chinese wares in this period. Some of us might be familiar with the, the simultaneous Chinese fashion, fascination with European things. The question I want to raise in this part of the lecture, which corresponds with the central question in the book I'm writing, is what do we do intellectually or historically with the fact of this seeming coincidence? of two sides of this kind of civilizational divide having almost mere image exoticizing tendencies one towards the other at almost precisely the same moment in history. I think it's unprecedented and it certainly is very surprising and, and to somebody who um, was trained in European cultural history uh, of the 17th and 18th century, it really was, was a sort of staggering realization um, to see the aspects of early modernity that I was trained to see as distinctly European really were not so distinctly European at all. The tendency to exoticize other peoples, for example, was, 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 was equally um, prevalent and important in Chinese early modernity as it was in Euro European early modernity. So this, this, this question of what, how we can make sense of this unexpected reciprocity of exoticism fascinates me deeply. So the basic question here in this part is, what are we to make of this rather striking instance of reciprocal exoticism where we find two distant cultures um, actively exoticizing each other in similar kinds of ways in the exact same historical moment? Is it just a coincidence? Probably not, I would argue. Uh, in some sense, in fact, it's, 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 it's almost predictable given the context of encounter. These two cultures are actively trading books, ideas, missionaries, or, 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 or people, ideas um, uh, throughout this period. So there is a lot of contact between them. It's not like they're entirely separate. And encounter always does imply exchange and circulation between two parties. So in some sense, the fact that there's some kind of reciprocity in this respect is unsurprising. Um, but while the context of the encounter helps perhaps to explain this phenomenon of reciprocity, to my mind, and this really is the, one of the key takeaways for this lecture, is that um, this is almost too obvious an explanation to be a sufficient explanation in that the explanation that, that these two places are contacting each other um, tends to prevent us from considering other perspectives on the phenomenon that might be equally helpful and more illuminating in making sense of it. In particular, the claim that reciprocity can be explained by exchange or circulation or contact tends to obscure the importance of structural congruities between two different cultures or two different histories that have nothing at all to do with encounter between the two cultures in accounting for this apparent convergence. So why do I say this? And, 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 and how, can I, how can I demonstrate this claim? This is where my rather unusual background in this context as a literary historian has proven helpful to me in thinking through what I find to be a really interesting intellectual problem. In the visual arts, um, resemblance and contiguity in the context of an encounter usually implies influence, right, or transference. If we see in one location a new emergence of a visual style that resembles an established style in another location, and we know that there's some contact between these two locations, it makes sense to hypothesize that somebody saw something from location one and copied it in, in location two, right? We, we, we can assume that um, some kind of process of influence or assimilation or adaptation has been at work, and we can, ex we, we can be safe in making that assumption because visual artists are pretty good at imitating stuff, right? They see something they like and they can usually figure out if they're good, they can figure out a way to reproduce it in another place. So it's very easy to uh, 
well, one's on fairly firm ground in the world of the visual arts in ascribing resemblance between two places that are in contact to um, influence or assimilation, right? Um, in the case of literature, it's much, much trickier to make the claim that imitation or assimilation is going on, especially when we're talking about literatures as vastly different, or languages as vastly different as English and Chinese. So for example, if Samuel Richardson, the famous 18th century English author of the novel Pamela, had been provided with a copy of the roughly contemporaneous Chinese novel, Hao Zhou Chuan, he would have been in no position to imitate it, even if he'd wanted to, right? Because he would have had a heck of a hard time making sense of those funny looking characters, right? And he would have had no access to anybody who could have helped him make sense of those characters. Right? This, 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 this book didn't get translated until well after Richardson's day. Likewise, if the early modern Chinese novelist Wu Jingzhu had been provided with a copy of the English novel Joseph Andrews by Henry Fielding, he would have been in no position to imitate it either for exactly the same reason, right? He would have had an awfully hard time with the English. And he uh, was very unlikely to have had access to anybody who could have helped him with the English. And yet, Samuel Richardson produced in the novel Pamela a tale strikingly similar with respect to both its thematic content and its literary historical innovations to the contemporary um, Chinese novel Hao Zhou Chuan. And Wu Jingzhu produced in the scholars, ruling Wai Shi, a novel very similar in the same ways to Joseph Andrews. These are congruities that we cannot explain through the processes of influence or assimilation that we're so um, habituated to, to drawing on in thinking about um, contiguous art historical contexts. And these are just two examples among many that I've, oops, sorry, among many that I found over the past several years, um, leading me to conclude that new developments in the 17th and 18th century literary worlds in China and England were synchronized to a remarkable degree at a time well before the circulation, the common circulation of literary translations. How can this be so? How can this be so? Very strange, right? Unexpected. This, this was a flabbergasting discovery to me as somebody who was trained in the history of the English novel and who wound up teaching courses at Michigan on the rise of the English novel from a paradigm that said that the English invented the novel. And the rise of the English novel was a, a, a yet another sign of, of the exemplary um, and exceptional nature of English civilization, right? Not right. <laughs> Completely wrong. <laughs> My graduate committee didn't fill me in on, on, on ruling why sure, right? Which is happening at the same time, making the same kind of uh, uh, advancements in terms of literary history as these English novels were. How can this be so? Well, I don't think this is a coincidence either, any more than the reciprocal uh, exoticisms are a coincidence. Both of these contexts, and this I think is the most obvious explanation for this seeming coincidence, both of these contexts, the European context and the Chinese context in the um, 17th and 18th centuries are being transformed simultaneously in terms of um, the social order and the social economy of these societies are being transformed by the rapid influx of Mexican silver. Right? This, is the, this is the great silver age. This is the period when the silver mines of Mexico and South America are being um, exploited, mined, and, and that all of this bullion is flooding European markets and flooding Chinese markets um, in this period and generating actually fairly similar kinds of social effects, leading to the rise of new kinds of luxury consumption, conspicuous consumption, um, 
uh, developments in, in, in literacy, in trade, in commerce. Uh, in England, it takes the form of what we call the rise of the middle class, um, the, the rise of a commercial economy, and very similar things are happening in both of these places as a result of this influx of silver into both of these world economies. Um, the silver prompted the emergence of, of, of comparable social developments and literary trends, and I think these are related, which is how we can make sense of this seeming coincidence as something more than a coincidence. What is most important for our present purposes, however, though, is not explaining these unexpected congruities between non-contiguous worlds, but rather what is important here is recognizing that the broad pattern of cultural synchronicity that we see in literature and philosophy, cultural synchronicity, the rise of similar kinds of ideas and literatures, um, same time, two different places, most likely extended to other spheres as well, and thereby contributed to the simultaneous flourishing of visual exoticism that we noted earlier. That is, my basic claim then, is the historical phenomenon of reciprocal exoticism, the Chinese exoticizing Europe at the same time the Europeans are exoticizing China in this period. The historical phenomenon of reciprocal exoticism is a product not only of contact and encounter, but also of what we might consider a kind of convergent evolution. So what are the implications of this hypothesis when we go and actually look at these objects in a museum. Part three, by asking the question, what are the implications of the hypothesis of convergent evolution that I offered as a way of making sense of the simultaneity of certain kinds of literary developments in the 18th century between China and England, and also possibly the simultaneity of the experience of exoticism in each of these contexts with respect to the other. So now we um, take a stab at trying to make sense of these implications. Um, as a background for this, I want to suggest that there are two dominant paradigms for what we might call comparative transcultural studies, right? The studies of things that are happening in, 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 in two different um, cultures. The, the first of these paradigms is what I call the connection or circulation model. This connection model focuses attention on the flow of objects or ideas or images, the influence that one culture's styles or techniques has on another, the assimilation by one culture or place or region of another places, um, ways of doing things with objects or words. This model is based on the presumption of the mobility of people and objects, that they can move from one place to another, and it requires some degree of geographical and or historical contiguity adjacency, being next to each other. Right? Um, as a comparative method, the connection paradigm typically ascribes observed resemblances between two places and the objects that they're producing uh, to various forms of influence. Right? So for example, if we think about the case of France and England, say, in the 18th century. There are all sorts of familiar examples of um, ideas and images that are going back and forth one to the other so that, some, so that you see you know, English gardens in France and you see French architecture in England and, 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 and so on and so forth with respect to literature and the arts and gardens and everything else. That would be a, a, play, a place where resemblances that we saw between, say, the French novel and the English novel we could ascribe to connection and circulation. It makes perfect sense. Um, the second paradigm for comparative transcultural studies, I call, um, well, I'm still struggling on what to call it. You can help me with this afterwards. For now, I'll use the rather laborious formulation, the non-contiguous comparison model. And this, you can see why I need to fix that. NCM, it doesn't even ring as an acronym. Um, 
This model focuses our attention, in contrast, on patterns of similarity between two contexts that cannot be readily ascribed to a causality of influence of any kind. This paradigm recognizes that resemblance does not necessarily require contact at all. Right? Similar cultural forms can emerge independently in very different times and places. This paradigm recognizes then that the emergence of these forms in different times and places can have similar explanations, such as the silver trade hypothesis that I've adduced in trying to make sense of certain structural similarities between Chinese and English literature, for example, of the 18th century, where there's no possibility of influence, so there has to be, maybe there, there's, there's some kind of structural resemblance between the cultures that then produces similar sorts of developments in the literary or artistic spheres. I find it helpful in thinking about this and recognizing the importance of this kind of non-contiguous comparison model to think about um, biological examples. This is the slide that I gave you a sneak preview of a minute ago. <laughs> so clearly, we're aware of cases where biological resemblance can have one of two very different kinds of explanation, right? If we, uh, we, we, we can, we can uh, see a connection model in terms of, of ancestral trees, shared ancestors and the like, uh, we might call this a homologous comparison, right? Two things that are similar because, in fact, that they're related. There's some kind of crossing over between uh, two um, images or creatures uh, that, they, that actually explains the resemblance between them in terms of real relatedness. On the other hand, we can have forms of resemblance in nature, such as wings, um, where there is no explanation based on connection or inheritance. Rather, rather the, the, the um, evolution of wings happens in different kinds of species, presumably because of similar kinds of ecological or environmental demands. This kind of resemblance I see as being a kind of biological counterpart to the non-contiguous comparison model that I've been talking about, what we might term anal analogous comparison, comparison by analogy as opposed to um, by shared familial inheritance. So the, the, in some ways what I'm suggesting is that the resemblances we've seen between China and Europe in the 18th century are in important ways comparable to the resemblances we see between, say, a bird wing and a bat wing, right? They're both wings, they both have the same function, but they're not related through connection in the way these two creatures are, right? Um, our case of reciprocal exoticisms that we've been talking about is surely a complex one, and both kinds of interpretive paradigms, I think, are applicable to this case. We can talk about both homologous and analogous kinds of comparison when we talk about China and England in the 18th century. I would argue, however, that in the presence of well-established channels of, of circulation, like we have between Europe and China, we tend habitually and quite predictably in our analysis, in our interpretation, we tend to privilege connection paradigms over the other kind, right? Just because it's so, it, it is so obvious, it's so commonsensical that things resemble each other because of the connections we see between the two places. And I think we make the habit of um, making these assumptions even when, it, as in our case, both kinds of paradigms are legitimate. There clearly are ways in which um, in spite of all the connections, there are resemblances that, that cannot be explained by connection. The consequence of this habit of leaning too heavily on the connection model is that distinctive forms of knowledge and insight produced by methodologies of non-contiguous comparison or analogical comparison 
tend to be neglected in cases like ours. That is, our habit of leaning too much on the connection paradigm prevents us from seeing the kinds of things we might see if we allowed ourselves to entertain uh, the comparative case. It, the, 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 the reliance on the connection model enforces a kind of tunnel vision on the phenomenon of intercultural um, correspondence and, and blinds us to certain kinds of things we might otherwise see. Specifically then, what are the benefits and affordances of non-contiguous or analogical comparison in the arts? And I, 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 would, I would suggest that there are two main benefits, two reasons why, in this case in particular, the China-Europe case, we really should be willing occasionally to put aside the obvious fact of historical connection and think about things in terms of structural comparison. Um, the first benefit of doing so is that this paradigm enables us to challenge the assumptions of European exceptionalism and to recognize broad historical patterns that simultaneously generate similar kinds of forms of historical and art, uh, cultural evolution on both sides of the, European, the Eurasian landmass in the early modern period. And secondly, um, giving space to the analogy paradigm enables us to see particular phenomena in both places from a new perspective that is available to us only through an embrace of of, of juxtaposition um, without a reliance on influence. I would like to, um, and this is where we get to, I guess we should get to, this is where we get to part four. I guess I should change slides here. Okay, part four. So comparative exoticisms. Um, and this is where we'll wrap up. I would like to conclude by suggesting that a side-by-side -side comparison of our two reciprocal cases of early modern exoticism can yield two useful kinds of insight in our specific case. First, I guess I should say what these are. It's, it's not immediately obvious. I'm using this as a kind of illustration. This is Q Pagoda, which was erected in Kew Gardens near London in the middle of the 18th century. This is the ruins of, the Europe, of one of the European palaces in the Summer Palace in Beijing, which was erected at almost exactly the same time. So here I'm going back to my reciprocal exoticisms theme. Um, so this comparison can help us uh, challenge assumptions of European exceptionalism. In the study of the early modern world, we're all too frequently led to suppose that Europe is a special case and that, it, that Europe's exoticizing gaze on other cultures, whether um, the South Pacific or the Americas or the Ottoman or, or the Chinese, is unique and unidirectional. Right? I think we, we all very often, working in the American or European art historical context, fall into the trap of imagining a certain kind of exceptionalism to the European exoticizing gaze. And secondly, this kind of comparison also encourage us, encourages us to revisit the category of the exotic with which we began and to recognize how certain common features of exoticism on the two sides bring previously unseen aspects of exoticism to light that we might not have seen before. Two, two interesting elements of the exotic, two observations about the exotic that this comparison, our comparison, brings immediately to mind are that both that exotic objects in both sides were characterized by fragility, first of all, and also, perhaps less obviously, by visual play and illusion. And we talked about both of these images. Note that neither of these features, and I and I think I think if you if you run back and 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 and, and look at archetypal uh, images of uh, Eurozerie, right? exoticized images of Europe in China or exoticized images of China in Europe, you'll see that in both cases that fragility, the fragility of objects, the things, things that will fall apart easily if they fall on the floor, and, and also the, the foregrounding of visual play and illusion as we saw in these images is, is a very common characteristic on both sides. Note that neither of these two features, 
fragility or visual play was immediately obvious to us in our original survey of the defining features of exoticism. But both of these features do stand out conspicuously when we put these two cases side by side. Note also that both of these attributes of fragility and visual playfulness can be seen in one sense or another to reinforce the utopian association with the exotic that we touched on earlier, in that both qualities reinforce the ephemeral, transient, dreamlike quality of the exotic as a source of pleasure and of utopian imagining, right? Um, the utopian is a place without a place, right? It is a fantasy that is, by definition, both illusory, illusionistic, and fragile. Right? It has the ephemerality of a dream. A dream is fragile. When you wake up, it's gone. Likewise, a utopian fantasy. Right? I, my suggestion here is that these two elements of the exotic that we see by doing a side-to-side -side comparison that is not obsessed with contiguity and influence allows us to recognize these features of the exotic um, in the early modern period that we might not have seen otherwise. It allows us to see, furthermore, the ways that these two features reinforce and correspond to this kind of secondary element of the exotic we talked about earlier in that, they, that the exotic is associated with um, utopian imaginings. Uh, fragility and illusion contribute, that is, to our ability in the vein of the utopian to think beyond the here and now, to imagine things that are not there, to imagine better, more appealing um, ways of being in the world or thinking of the world to provide a kind of escape from the ordinariness of the everyday. These two features also remind us that the exotic, by fashioning an aesthetic uh, from the typical experience of bewilderment and confusion that comes from an encounter with the truly foreign also serves to contain and domesticate and sublimate the potential threat of the unknown and to relieve the observer of the responsibility of coming to terms with the threat of the unknown as anything other than a fantasy. Right? So in some sense, the effect of these two components cuts both ways. On the one hand, it, pro it provides a way into utopian imaginings, which we might understand as generally a positive or a, a, a good thing, like, like a pleasant dream. On the other hand, it does have, or it can have, a certain kind of potentially problematic political dimension. Right? in that the ways in which we transform the foreign or the other through the aesthetic of the exotic tends to have the effect of relieving us of the responsibility of encountering, reckoning with the difference posed by the foreign to our familiar ways of being in the world, reckoning in a responsible and honest way with the confrontation with our own reality, with the confrontation with our own vision, right? And it, it in some sense relieves us of that responsibility. It allows us to be complacent in our assumptions that our reality is the reality and not to um, contend in serious ways with the opportunities for alternative realities um, that are opened up by a responsible and sustained engagement with otherness. The exoticizing gaze, then, can be seen from this comparison that we've developed in this lecture to represent something like a strategy of domination over another people or culture, a strategy for imagining or projecting superiority, 
over the other in that the reality of the observer is, is given a kind of primary place over the seemingly merely fantastical or utopian um, reality ascribed to the other. As we know, and I'll, 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 I'll wrap up with this sentiment so we can have some um, time for, for discussing all of this. I'm very interested in your opinions. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up with the observation that this strategy of using the exotic for projecting a certain kind of, projecting or imagining a certain kind of superiority, the strategy didn't work out very well for the Qing dynasty in the 19th century when the Chinese imperial fantasies of an exotic, obsequious Europe that was the source of interesting visual techniques and nice mechanical clocks and such things, quaint timekeeping machines, ingenious painterly methods may have distracted the ruling class in China from the very real technological and military threat that would manifest itself in the opium wars, right? What is the possibility? I mean, it's really interesting to think of the fact that the first target of the French soldiers when they went into Beijing in the opium wars was to destroy what? Just to destroy this exoticizing illusion of Europeanness that they found in the summer palaces. Right. What is the possibility that the experience of exoticism, the indulgence in exoticism on the part of the Chinese ruling class in this period, and certainly on the part of the emperor, um, in some sense hypnotized him into a kind of stupor, which then neglected the other aspects of foreignness, which he quite fatally failed to take into account, um, which led to these humiliating defeats um, in the Opium Wars for which the Chinese then had to spend the next 150 years um, recovering from, right? Um, but the strategy, as, 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 as much as this has been something of a cliche in 19th century historical studies, it's interesting to look at in the present context as well, in the 21st century context. It may be that the strategy of exoticizing the other may well prove to have been misguided in the other direction also, as China's newly restored position of dominance on the world stage in 2018. You can see clear signs of that, right? Xi Jinping just managed to remove term limits and he's presumably gonna do all sorts of things with his newfound power. Um, China's newly restored position of dominance on the world stage increasingly troubles long-standing collective Western fantasies about China that have been sustained in part by a reciprocal exoticizing gaze that goes all the way back to the 17th and 18th centuries. So I think I'll stop there. I'm delighted to take your questions. Thank you.